next panel on DeFi, TradeFi, and CBDC regulation. Our panelists are going to discuss innovation and regulation in each sector and how they're interrelated. It will be moderated by Neil Hirschman from the Israeli Crypto Companies Forum. And our panelists are Adam Hart, Senior Investigator at Chainalysis, Nicole Sandler, Head of Digital Policy at Barclays, Yael Lipskin, CBDC Product Lead at INX, Elad Lieberman, CEO at Sun Crypto Blockchain Technology, and finally, Mehran Stiebel, General Counsel at Fireblocks. I see that people are leaving. You shouldn't. Uh -oh. It's going to be a fun panel. Really? I Everyone can see you're leaving too. No, don't. It's going to be a fun panel. I you can't think? wait. Yeah. All right, so I wanted to say good evening, but it's not evening yet, right? But it's after lunch, so everybody's a little bit drowsy. So let's start. So first of all, uh, I would like to congratulate everybody who succeeded to, who managed to succeed to, um, to stay up until this stage. We're going to talk a little bit about, um, about CFI, TradeFi, and DeFi. Um, and as we were all introduced before, I want to drop the first question, okay, to the panel. And uh, please feel free to just jump in. Why do we need CBDC at all? Because, you know, it's a decentralized world. It's, we're talking about cryptocurrencies. We're talking about the major, the major innovation was let's decentralize currencies. And suddenly we're saying, yeah, let's take the decentralization, but let's centralize everything. So it's, it's a question that I actually get asked a lot by our central banks and then I work for a commercial bank so as you can imagine it's going to be quite a big culture shock to us if a central bank digital currency comes in. And I'm often asked, is it a problem in search of a solution or a solution in search of a problem? And I, I think it's really interesting when I, I hear words like cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin being used as a currency, I appreciate there'll be many different views in this room. But for those of us who have tried to use Bitcoin as a currency, it's, it's very expensive and it's, it's very volatile. So. Oh, need to, need to yeah, get a bit closer. Uh, yeah. um, so I think it's really important to remember it's not a one-size-fits-all. So why is a central bank looking at doing a CBDC? Now, I've never been to the Bahamas. I've heard it's very, very nice. But they actually have it. They have a CBDC. They're one of the few jurisdictions that has one in operation. And the reason they have it is because there are so many different islands that they wanted to have ATMs. They couldn't have ATMs on all of them. So they needed a way to have financial inclusion, public cash available to their citizens. So they looked at it from a financial inclusion um, perspective. If you were to go to Sweden, they would go, well, we're about 80 to 85% cashless. Again, we want to be able to have public money for our citizens. To have that, we need to have a digital currency. So that, that's their motivation. Other jurisdictions will say, Cross-border payments are really expensive, they're really clunky, they're very difficult. What is a way to make them better? Some jurisdictions will go, well, look, China's looking at doing a CBDC. What we do not want is a central bank digital currency from China, which is being used in multiple other jurisdictions and is affecting dollarization. So it's a geopolitical concern. So there, there are lots of different drivers, and I think you have to look up for each jurisdiction what the driver is but make sure that it's not a central bank digital currency, which is a direct model, as in the central bank is doing everything. And they don't want to do everything. I can tell they definitely don't want to be dealing with customer complaints. So it, you want to have an indirect model, including intermediaries such as banks, fintechs. But it needs to also be on even footing with different types of money, because otherwise you'll be in a world where lots of people want to use a CBDC, and then you've disintermediated the banks, and you've ended up with financial stability concerns. So there are the few reasons why one might want to do a CBDC in a centralized model. And Mayor Anstiebel, uh, Fireblocks, um, I'm going directly to you um, because of your, because of your uh, great experience in central banking and banking at all. Um, do we actually need CBDCs or is it just something of a trend that central banks are going after the trends? Yeah, well... I think that CBDC has a solid ground. Uh, there are two main roles which you mentioned. One, it's financial stability and mon monetary stability, which I think that in the commercial world, this is not something that the commercial bank, for instance, it's not a gap that they will be able to complete. So I think that looking at these two roles, 
So one is, has to do with inflation, the other one is uh, maintaining the value of, this, for instance, a stable coin. So I think that on these roles, it will be very hard to find a good fit in the commercial world outside in the centralized scape. Yael, um, let me go to you. Um, when we're talking about CBDCs, and um, we're talking a little bit about privacy, you've mentioned before, uh, Nicole mentioned before uh, China. Um, how do we keep CBDCs from becoming a mass surveillance uh, instrument? You're talking about CBDCs as something that, is, that can be transparent to the government every uh, dollar that we pass from one person to another being uh, written on the blockchain and you can see everything that goes around. How do we, how do we uh, contain it and how do we see that it doesn't become this mass surveillance instrument? Okay, so first of all, uh, I have to say it's a very valid concern. Uh, and central bank's approach toward it is, um, is, is very uh, sensitive to the privacy and security issue. And um, I can only, I, I'll start by saying that in general, the central banks are really uh, happily ab adopting the benefits of the blockchain. And they want to make the infrastructure of the payment system safer, faster, and cheaper. So that is their main motivation. And um, the CBDC is the equivalent of cash in the digital world. So it's, uh, it should have, it's supposed to have uh, the same characteristics of privacy and uh, security. And um, this, it's not going to replace cash, it's going to leave aside it as another instrument of payment. Um, and uh, when the BIS, the Bank of Institutional Settlements, which is like the father of all central banks, um, the way that this, the BIS is framing the privacy issue, which is, I have to say, is a key issue in the heart of the discussion of central banks that I specifically met, um, there are, they are framing that CBDC, they explicitly write it, uh, must, be, um, must protect the rights of the users and their uh, ability to keep their uh, financial data safe. And uh, I think that central banks today are really, they're experimenting how the population will adopt it because they understand that if it will be conceived as a, as, as a payment instrument which is unsafe or inconvenient, it will not be adopted. So that is also one of their motivations. They're not into controlling everything and obviously they, the technology that are being experimented um, are cryptographic technologies like uh, um, zero knowledge proof and blind signatures for example, that are being investigated in the experiments and the pilots that the central banks are doing, and there is one right now called Helvetia, for example, with the Swiss bank and the BIS, which is examining exactly that. So, yes, it is a concern, but uh, I'm pretty optimistic about it. Nicole, you want to so add something? I think they were all really great points. So the only thing I would add, so how many people in this room use WhatsApp, use Facebook? That's what, I would, that's what I would expect. So when the European Central Bank put out a consultation on CBDCs, one of the things that came back was the privacy challenge, that, that citizens were really worried about what was going to happen to their privacy. So there were different models that the European Central Bank is, is looking at in terms of how much they would see in a transaction, how much an intermediary would see. But I would go back to the privacy paradox. So I also use social media. And when I use social media, I tick a box. And my data does what my data does. Yeah, but but if if I can if I can just add to this, when you're talking about WhatsApp, you're end-to-end -end encrypted. When you're talking about Facebook, it is a problem. But then again, you see other types of social media are blooming, and then you're not. And when you're talking about social media, it's private corporations. But but my point is yes. that people worry about privacy when something goes wrong. They don't worry about it so much when it's convenient for them. So I think the privacy issue is a massive issue, but I think that sometimes it's, it's oversaid as being a real issue for people because when they actually get to using it, they won't be thinking about privacy. I'm sure none of us think about privacy when we're, until something goes wrong when we're using our platforms. I, I definitely don't, and I read the T's and C's, so that says a lot about me. 
Um, I think that every day, yeah, you're right, we're giving voluntarily data, our privacy, but I think here the uh, angle is a little bit different and it's a point of access to data, which up, like presently it doesn't exist. Like if you look at uh, the legislation that um, the uh, Chok Bank Israel, the legislation on the Bank of Israel, the central bank, you can see in section 39 that the governor has access to almost every and each data. So I think this is the heart of the discussion, not us providing voluntarily data because we're doing that on a daily basis on social media. It's the access of government to real time uh, transaction and data, which can cause a problem or some skepticism around it. So I think maybe this is the heart of the discussion and there's a few ways to go about it. I mean, uh, today I think there is access to data, which is also the heart of the discussion. Uh, so it's nothing new. We're not renewing anything. We're not inventing anything new. It just the CBDC will might and blockchain technology will make it easier to access this data and maybe a larger chunk of this data. So what do we do in this, you know, scenario? And uh, also today in democratic society, we have balances between the right of privacy and the right of the government to access data. So it's a matter of balances, but I don't think that the discussion is also around privacy. It's more of the political ecosystem that, um, that the country is under. Meaning maybe in China, the access to data will be different as opposed to access in other jurisdictions. But, you th but it's as a you political feature. Yeah, but as you look at it, let, let's say, I'm, I'm just following up and then I'm going to you guys, but I'm just following up on this point. Because you're saying, okay, so at 39, we had legislation that actually gives the right to the central bank to access almost any bank account. But then again, you see that uh, the amount of cash payment here in Israel and actually in other parts of the world other parts of the OECD, uh, and when we're talking about OECD uh, countries, we're talking about the United States, you have a lot of cash payments, meaning that you have a lot of economic activity, which lies in, first of all, which lies in shades, but somehow gives people the opportunity to be private, and we can all speculate on the examples why we need some money to be private, and then again, you take blockchain technology, which was supposed to be decentralized, which was supposed to um, add to the liberty of the, of the individual, and you actually take cash payments and turning into something that you can actually follow. It somehow confines, confines the, the liberties of a person, of an individual, isn't it? Again, I don't think, I mean, you're speaking about a scenario where we will replace cash completely. I don't think this is the, the right scenario to look at. It. It's just a way to utilize the technology and provide maybe uh, remedies and, and the answer to, to some problems that currently we have. Like you mentioned before, the cross payment, the interportability between stable coins. And we can utilize it. So yeah, in 2008, after the subprime crisis, there was an entire ideology surrounding DeFi and centralized. But it doesn't mean that we can't utilize it also for more um, CFI needs, let's say. I would, also like, I would also like to mention just, you know, numbers, that in 2025, the prediction is that uh, only 12, I think maybe 10 or 12 percent of the payments in the world will be in cash. So it's kind of an inevitable uh, path that we're going to. And yes, I totally agree that it's a, a matter of uh, geopolitical and the way that each jurisdiction and authority will work with it. Um, but again, uh, I think it's uh, harnessing the blockchain technology and, and making good out of it. Because eventually, if I would like to pay um, Nicole, I will not be able to do it because she's not working with cash and I don't have cash. So if I'm going to a country that cash is almost dead there, what will I do? Okay, and never mind. <laughs> no, it's fine, it's fine. Um, so a lot thinking of this, you know, of the things that come out of this panel, it's somehow mixed. You know, if you're talking about CBDC, it's not, it does not seem as positive as you know, as the media illustrated it, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's because that, um, 
you can mix between two things, which we're all trying to do. There is the technology and there is the asset. It's completely two different things. So you can have a decentralized technology, but a centralized asset, which is perfectly fine. And CBDC, with all the respect that everybody is speaking about, it's something new. It's just the new shiny ball. There is nothing new. Dollar currently, CBDC, it's the same thing. You have a private ledger, interly in banking. It's the exact same type of transaction. It's digital transaction that can be instant if they want to. They don't have an issue in regarding to exposing their ledger, like now we're talking about proof of reserves and auditing and all of those things. The only thing is that it's the infrastructure. Now, she was mentioning, you were mentioning about the fact that it's expensive. It's expensive not because of the asset. It's expensive because of the infrastructure, the way that it's passing, the way that it's working. Now, we need to understand something. We have the dollars, right? In the end, the CBDC will be pledged to something. So let's talk in the United States. Let's say they're doing a CBDC in the United States. They will pledge it to probably the US dollars, which means that regarding to the manipulation and everything that is happening with the currency, it's still going to happen. It's going to be the same thing. It's just that the dollar loses credibility. Nobody is trusting it no more. And if we look at Turkey, for example, which they lost complete trust in their currency, they just need to give the people something new that is shiny. And CBDC sounds very, very good. Now, they like to go and to join it with the blockchain and decentralization and all of those things, which you don't have to. CBDC, as something new that will come, can be perfectly fine, and it's OK. It will be centralized, yes. The government will be able to track it and see it, of course, like they do currently. But all the rest of the cryptocurrencies are like that. Respectfully, sorry, the US dollar does, does not have a central bank digital currency. A central no, bank, a cent but you, know, you said that they currently have one, they yeah. don't. A CBDC ah, is something, so they will be yeah, one. because it's, I mean. it's a direct liability of the central bank. Yeah. And there is no direct liability of the central bank with the dollar. In fact, the US dollar is, is one of the CBDCs that would come much later because they are so worried for your, the things you've talked about on privacy. And they, they will follow other jurisdictions at a much later date if they were to do one. But it, it does not exist. No, 100%. What I'm saying is that if they do follow, right, then they do a CBDC. Just probably that's what will happen in the rest of the world. Of course, there was some country that would do it first. The United States usually like to look at it, see how it works in other places, see the mistake they're making, and then not repeating their mistake. 100%. But what I'm saying is, if you look at it like that, how CBDC is different with what you currently have? We could do programmability of money that we don't currently have with certain commercial Such banks. Such as what? OK, so let's say you're in a work. I also feel like uh, that Adam should, should be saying That's something. That's great. Adam, Adam's next, but I think it's interesting. Okay, Keep on. So let's say you're in a world where we're trying to green the economy. Now, I don't like doing taxes. I have to do them. It's laborious. It's annoying. But I have to do them. Let's say that my, my, my CBDC is programmed to say, if you're spending a certain amount on heating, doing X, Y, and Z, you are going to get a tax rebate immediately for doing it. That doesn't exist at the moment. Or at least it doesn't exist in my bank account. If it exists in yours, I really want to go and start doing stuff way yeah, where you still, guys are. Yeah, again, but still, then again, it sounds pretty nice. But, um, you know, in Israel, um, one of the things that we saw that excessive power like this is causing some unexpected problems. Let's say the, the text messages at the pandemic, we had a case where a person, or well, the health ministry person, sent a text quarantine messages to his ex-wife in order to put her actually uh, in quarantine where she didn't, where she didn't want it, she didn't where you were supposed to be in quarantine, but he just had the power and the knowledge to send those, those text messages. But then also do you look, get rid of sorry, text just messages? just to touch your point, which is the point, but look also what she said. She said that basically, oh, let, let, let in order to create a CBDC, you need to empower that there will be less privacy. Yeah, so it comes down to design choices. You, you asked for a use case, I gave you one on, on tax, so whether you want to use it, that's, that's a different question. But it comes down to your design choices. How much privacy are you going to allow? What technology? Because it doesn't have to be on DLT. The Chinese PBOC CBDC, the actual base isn't on DLT. It comes up at the intermediary inter interface level. So it, it, how are you going to design it? And that could solve your problem. But you're not going to get rid of text messages because someone sent one that had their wife get into a problem in spot. Adam, I want to go to you and I want to um, somehow sum up the whole privacy discussion. Um, you're a senior training specialist at Chainalysis. Um, do you at Chainalysis have some sort of boundaries regarding privacy when you're investigating um, when you're when you're investigating transactions? 
Yeah, I think that's a great question. And, and also, I think an interesting one to think about um, future CBC, CBDC design uh, in contrast to sort of what we have today when it comes to decentralized finance and really cryptocurrencies writ large. Uh, because as, as was pointed out very rightly earlier, um, when I conduct a transaction on the blockchain, i.e. what I can do today um, in, in crypto land, uh, I put that information out there to the public, right? So that information is completely available to anyone who wants to go and look at that transaction in a block. Not explorer. all of the information. If you're talking about Lightning, if you're talking about uh, ZK Snarks, if you're talking about, you know... Right. Some, Generally, well, some we, we part of the information is out. Yeah, but you know, if I'm conducting, say, a Bitcoin or an Ethereum transaction, I put my, my transaction okay. out in the public, um, and then that transaction information is available to anyone. However, that information is pseudonymous. Um, so you know, there, there's some level of individual privacy there. Um, in terms of sort of what Chainalysis does as a company, and I'm, I'm also, you know, I, I work on our investigations team, so we follow a lot of illicit money as it moves around on the blockchain. Um, essentially, you know, the, the data set that we have and what blockchain analytics companies like us do is we, we don't look for individuals. So it's not uh, your name would, it would not be in a chain analysis database. Instead, it's a mapping of sort of entities on the blockchain to, to give a sense of what's going on. Uh, is money flowing from Gemini in exchange to Coinbase in exchange, or is it flowing from a darknet market to a fraud shop? Those are the sort of entities that we can see on the blockchain. Um, and then, you know, an, an interesting point, and I, I'd be curious to hear the rest of the panel's uh, takes on this one, um, but, uh, you know, when, when we're talking about the difference between cash and, and other assets, uh, you know, oftentimes we, we hear, or at least, you know, when I go and talk to regulators or, or public sector folks, um, I hear concerns that, oh, crypto is illicit, you can't see any activity that happens on the blockchain. However, what we hear from investigators is, is actually the exact opposite in the sense that investigators, uh, the ones who, who are familiar with the crypto space and, and are not sort of uh, you know, weirded out by a new transaction, they're more comfortable investigating illicit activity that happens on, say, Bitcoin than they are uh, in the traditional financial world because cash is hard to trace and also you know, the, the correspondent banking system is difficult to work through. It's difficult to find beneficial ownership, whereas everything is public on the blockchain. Um, um, I wanted to follow up on this one. So you're saying that you're actually kind of clustering um, and sort of blacklisting transactions, how can somebody get opt out of that blacklist if he's blacklisted by mistake? So again, we, we don't, we're, we're not a blacklister, we're, we're just a, a data provider, and um, I'd, be, I'd be curious to hear other folks' uh, takes on this one as well. Uh, but, you know, essentially, uh, Chainalysis as a data provider uh, says, okay, these sets of entities are, are an exchange, this set of entities is, is a darknet market, and we, we only cluster things that we are 100% sure about. Um, and then we provide that data to, say, an exchange, and they can take their compliance decision to decide, okay, I want to bank this customer, or, or I don't want to you know, allow this customer to access my product. But you know, that, that's a decision that, that each individual business would take uh, based on the data they have available. Okay, um, if you want to say anything about it. Yeah, I'm actually working with China and We have a couple of reactor certified guys with us, and I was going through the course as well. Basically what China is doing, which is just like you said, they're mapping it for you, right? So they're doing a China analysis data for you, and you can see the addresses. Now, it's corrected on the side of China analysis. Basically, they can just tell you, okay, this is the source, this is the destination. What we need to understand is slowly, slowly as it's growing and the requirements are coming, like for Mika 5 and all of the rest, that they're going to be KYC. So in the end, you can know who is the owner of the wallet. So they provide you the mapping, and then you as the exchange, for example, who is the destination, most, in our case, the destination, most of the time, I know exactly who is the owner of this wallet, right? So privacy, when you're talking about it, and actually in blockchain, that's why we like to do investigation more on blockchain, it's much easier. Because you got all the mapping right in front of you, which with other infrastructures, let's say, or cash especially, you can do. Okay, so I want to go back to the, um, to the CBDC infrastructure, and I want to go to you, Eliel. Do you think uh, CBDC should be issued by central banks, or actually do we need a, a framework for a privatized CBDC? Well, CBDC is central bank, digital currency, and I like the fact that you're nodding your head here for uh, agreement with me. 
Um, what you just said, private CBDC is an oxymoron. <laughs> I would even say that. Um, and <laughs> okay, so I think that uh, eventually the idea is that the central bank digital currency would be would be one hundred percent back up, backed up, and and liquid. And uh, private CBDC, which is kind of a stable coin, stable coin is, from my point of view, is kind of a synthetic CBDC. Um, I think that would be, um, eventually, it will not be safe to use it. And um, the way central banks see the private banking system, uh, they see them, or the PSPs, they see them as intermediators doing the KYC checks. And um, if, if it's not, this is how they're going to be probably involved, and this is what most experiments uh, examine right now, this model of uh, intermediary. And um, I, I, I don't believe in it, actually. I, I totally don't believe in it, because I think it will end up just being like a stable coin, and we know that stable coins are issued by private companies which are not a, re, not necessarily regulated or uh, um, anyway I don't think it's it's gonna work and yeah, yeah I actually believe that for example let's take circle right so they are regulated they are their capital adequacy is one to one means that they are backed one to one in their assets I believe that they are under more restrict uh, regulation, let's call it, or enforcement type of thing, than the government itself, right? So, for example, United States, we already know, they can print whenever they want. What will stop them from just making more CBDCs and then say that, okay, we're covering it with bonds or we're covering it with whatever they do, right? They know how to do it very good when they want to do it. A private company will be much more scared, it's much more regulated, and we see it with Circle. Circle is existing for a long time already. Their stable coin is always pledged to the dollar. They never had any problem with capital adequacy. They're always there. They are very transparent. So this is a private CBDC. I mean, it, I, it's not a CBDC for the reason in that... A, they, in a way, I'm saying, not the, the definition. So yes. I, I think the question isn't about whether there'd be a private CBDC, because I agree with you, I think it's an oxymoron. It's how do they work together? What is the interoperability between... Because you want to be able... So if you look at what the G20 said and, and others, you want to be able to use these different currencies. It, it's meant to be competitiveness between the currencies, right? So if you... If, if you, and when you said about the US printing loads of CBDCs, you're going to have to have holding limits or something to stop it being wide circulation because you don't want to have a situation where all oh, you've got is CBDCs. But you want to have a situation where if a CBDC does exist, and I personally think there will be a time, I don't know when, that on the retail side, CBDCs will be in existence wider than, for instance, China and the Bahamas. How do you switch between something like Circle? How do you switch between a CBDC? How do you switch be between commercial bank money? Because otherwise you're going to have massive fragmentation issues and that's going to be a real challenge. And if you've got a holding limit, how do you then interoperate between how much you can spend on a CBDC and then how much you could do on Circle, for instance? I think those are more of the questions that I, I would think about than whether you should have one which is privately backed or one which isn't because a central bank digital currency is one which is linked to a central bank. And if you don't have that, then it doesn't exist. Then it's not a CBDC. Then it's a stable coin or something. Milan. Yeah, I do think that also, uh, Elad, you mentioned that Circle works better as a regulated private entity as opposed to the government. And this is a nice uh, perception. Having said that, maybe we can think that Circle is uh, operating sufficiently enough because it's being regulated and supervised by the government. So where does it start and where does it end? I mean, we're being, we're being very skeptical around you know, government and authorities and the way that they uh, manipulate inflation and other things. But we forget that this is an organization and this is an entire infrastructure that was built very accurately. And currently, for instance, the Sandrine Bank is the only uh, authority, at least in Israel, that is allowed to, um, to issue legal tenders, such as Shekel. So I think replacing that and stepping into these shoes would be really hard and really hard to accomplish by a commercial uh, entities that are driven by other incentivations. Adam. Yeah, yeah so I, I think it's a, a 
important distinction between a stable coin and a, a CBDC, but I, I think it's also important to sort of examine what stable coins are doing already and how they're being used, because clearly there, there's demand for stable coins, especially US dollar denominated stable coins. Uh, if, if we look at the data, it's about 99% of all stable coins by value are US dollar pegged. Um, and you know, primarily, they're, they're not being used in the US. So it's people outside of the US who want to use this new asset uh, that's not a central bank digital currency. You don't have the guarantee that the, the US government is, is issuing this. But if you're, say, in Argentina, then maybe that's a nice way to get access to a more stable asset, in your, your view, a more desirable asset, that you can also do all the interesting things that come with you know, having money on the blockchain. Um, so you can do things like use decentralized finance, which I know we're, we're probably going to touch on at some point. Uh, but, you know, I, I think it's important to, to think about what stablecoins are doing already, because clearly, you know, that's, that's one of the few areas in crypto where, where I think there's pretty clear product market fit. Uh, you know, uh, USDC, Circle's primary asset, has about $40 billion in circulation last I checked. Tether is, is a little bit above that, and, and they're being actively used sort of all over the world, and we, we see that in, in our data set. And I, I think it's important to you know, think about why people find these, these forms of private money interesting, even if it's not sort of directly issued by, by the you know, Federal Reserve in the US. Do they have another option? Exactly, yeah. I'm not sure they have another option. That's, and I'm not oh, even sure that the stable coins that you're using are backed up. I completely agree. Yeah, I, I think they're they're backed. Uh, you know, it's dollars in a bank account. But then you know the fact Private that your bank account. Yeah, yeah, your dollars in a bank account in in a regulated. Well, I don't. I, I invest, and I would not trust this kind of uh, instrument to back me up on my investment. All right. Hello. So I think if you look at it, also look at the adoption and where it is being adopted. It's being adopted much more in countries where they lose their trust in their government. And if you lose your trust in the government, you lose your trust in the government issued currency. And that's where it's going. Now, why would people go to crypto in general and to go to Circle, for example, or use it, you know, all of those things, and we see that it's growing? It's because of this fact. You have inflation, for example, right? I don't want to keep money which I'm losing on a yearly basis. And I don't want to trust if they showed me that they are untrustworthy. And that's why I believe that all of the stable coins and all the crypto, it's only going to grow in adoption. And we see it's growing. So. We're using the term crypto and stablecoin in a really, really wide manner. So I think the very first panel I did was 2015 or 2016, and I was like, there are 300 different types of crypto assets. I did one, let's say, four months ago, where I said there are 18,000 different types of crypto assets. Some of them can be used as a forms of payment. A lot of them can't be. So we, we shouldn't be talking about them as if they're one thing. All staple coins are the same. They're not. Some stable coins will be backed by fiat. Some will be backed by other cryptos. Some could be backed by gold. It, they're not on even footing. So to, I think you made a really, really valid point about regulation. Because to me, if you want to trust something in, in most democratized jurisdictions, you need to have the right regulation to do so. And that's why I think it's been a real problem with uptake of, of certain cryptos. Because there isn't so much trust in the market. In some jurisdictions, there might be. But in others, and you know, recent events hasn't really helped trust in the market. So the more you can have fit for purpose regulation, stuff we're seeing in the EU, the better it will be for the market going forward. Um, I want to I go back to, uh, I, I want to go back to uh, an issue that you actually raised. Um, and to touch up on, uh, on DeFi, do you think that the implosion of uh, FTX and Celsius as CeFi actors will cause or will make a new wave of uh, um, DEXs and DeFi applications? To me? Yeah? 100% yes. I think that every failure or big event is bringing up new innovations and bringing up new solutions. We always see it. And I think that people with FTX, because it was such a major player, and it was like an American company with a lot of users and a lot of money that was lost, people really understand that you need non-custodial and self-custody is really a solution and, and they really need to learn more about it. Now, I agree that it's maybe it's early because it's complicated. People don't really know how to use self-custody wallets or cold wallets as we call them. But I believe that that's really gave the push for the innovation, projects like ours, for example, um, and for people to actually learn about it. And this is one of the, I believe, the most critical steps into adoption. People need to know how to use the technology. Miran? Um. <laughs> You'll need to decide. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I think they're going to be a new wave. 
I might not know how to articulate that because I don't come from innovation. I'm just uh, doing legal, boring stuff. Um, I do think that it will be like, I mean, if there was, we, when you come to think about it, uh, some people think that the, the failures that we recently suffered from FTX, Celsius, Terra, were originated from the lack of regulation or some gap or some convenient regulated uh, countries that offered a more permissive regime, such as the Bahamas, which is uh, notorious these days, I guess, because of FTX. I do think that it will be uh, follow up with regulation. We have some new regulation in the pipeline. We have the pending MICAR in Europe that refers to stable coins, which by the way, I think that will bring a new uh, wave uh, to the ecosystem and more legal and uh, regulatory certainty. Uh, I do think that it's also, if we link it to CBDC, so I see the stablecoin as part of the evolution towards CBDC because that will cater the interportability between stablecoins, which is going to be issued by um, financial institutions. So I do think it's something that is coming up. And I think it's also a good exercise because I think the, the things that teach us the most are post-mortem. We see scandals, we see use cases, we see fraudulent behavior, and then we're able to respond to them more because we know how to articulate the risk better. Nicole, I wanted to, um, I wanted to somehow follow up on this one. What kind of regulation do you see in the DeFi space as being um, um, that is being formulated now nowadays in regard to Mika and uh, other regulations? So Mika is interesting because actually technically it doesn't cover DeFi in its most technical manner. And I, I think you made a really interesting point about, about regulation in FTX. So when I think about FTX, what happened? Well, it was a bad actor. Above and beyond anything, it was a bad actor. It was bad governance. There was no segregation of client funds. I mean, I haven't read the T's and C's for FTX, but I'm pretty confident it didn't say you can take the crypto assets and use them for the hedge fund. So it, there, were, there were lots of failings at FTX, which when I look at Mika, they would have had liquidity provisions. They would have had conflicts of interest provisions, like the conflicts of interest between the different businesses, massive. They would have had segregation of client funds. Um, there would have been supervisory colleges, which would mean that they'd be able to, the different regulators would talk between themselves to see what issues were coming up. Because in a crypto ecosystem, there are so many different policymakers that need to be discussing with each other. What it doesn't deal with is conglomerates, and I think that's something Mika will need to look at. But the challenge for Mika is that it deals with the issuer, and when you're looking at DeFi, you don't always know who the issuer is. So I think th those are some of the I mean, sometimes you can if you're doing on-off on -off ramp, but not, in not all cases, and that's why they say, we don't currently cover DeFi, but we're going to look at it 18 months after it comes into application. We'll do a report. The UK say they will look at NFTs. They will look at DeFi. So, but let, let's, let's see where they land. But I do think regulation would have really helped in the FTX case, because if it had been based in, in the Europe and Mika had been in existence, which it's currently not, client funds would have been protected. So that, that would have solved one of the main failings. Um, Adam, do you want to follow up on this? Yeah, um, I, I think FTX is certainly an interesting case study. Um, again, you know, as a data provider, we, we saw some really interesting reactions um, in terms of what, what cryptocurrency users did as well, um, which, you know, certainly we're, we're waiting to see what the regulatory response will be, and, and there will certainly be one. Uh, but I, I think, you know, what we saw immediately after was a, a crisis of confidence of cryptocurrency users in the you know businesses that provide services on on these networks, uh, so we saw a pretty you know astounding outflow of funds from centralized businesses to self custody wallets, uh, which again some would argue is uh, really how crypto was intended to be used as the first place. Is you know if you control your keys directly, you control your assets. It's a better asset. But uh, from our perspective, you know, that, that crisis of confidence also opens the door potentially to a lot of scammers because holding funds yourself, uh, you know, having cash under your mattress, that's a real risk. And if bad actors can persuade you to, to give up custody of your funds, to accidentally, you know, send, send someone your private keys without realizing it, that's bad for the ecosystem, that's bad for adoption. 
Um, and you know, self-custody is, is fundamentally not for everyone. I probably don't want my, my grandmother self-custodying her cryptocurrency. I, I probably want her using a, a cryptocurrency exchange. Uh, but you know, for, for her to feel comfortable using a cryptocurrency exchange, and you know, I've had this conversation with her somewhat recently over Thanksgiving in the US, uh, but you know, she's going to need to feel confident that the, the exchange will be there a year from now and not you know, doing what, what FTX did. Are you experiencing difficulties when you're trying to cluster uh, the activity at the DeFi um, at the DeFi ecosphere? Yeah, so I think it's a really interesting challenge. Um, we unfortunately don't have time to really get into it uh, here, but you know, thinking about tracking activity on uh, platforms like Ethereum, things that are based on the account model and not the, the unspent transaction output model, um, is definitely very different. Um, it, you know, we, we have sort of come up with different ways to visualize things. We, we have like a DeFi specific investigative tool versus our, our standard tool. Um, but I, I think there's just so much information there. It's a matter of understanding everything and just trying to keep up with the ecosystem rather than, you know, a, a fundamentally sort of different challenge of the information not being there at all. All right, thank you very much. I would like to thank Adam Hart and Nicole Sandler, yeah, Lipskin, and Elad Lieberman and Mayran Stiebel. Thank you very much.